Welcome to this edition of This Week in Civil Engineering, also known as TWICE, a weekly news show focused on providing civil engineering professionals with the most important and relevant industry updates. I'm your host for this episode, Jeff Smith. I'm a licensed professional engineer practicing structural engineering in New York City. I oversee a team of the most creative designers building, renovating, and sustaining the world's future landmarks. You can find all the episodes of This Week in Civil Engineering at twice.news. That's twice, T-W-I-C-E dot news. References to all of the news stories covered will be in the episode show notes. And if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the Twice playlist to receive weekly episodes. Now it's time for what's happening this week in civil engineering. Now it's time for this week's news. You're about to hear excerpts from the stories referenced. Links to all of the full articles can be found at twice.news. First, let's cover the biggest breaking news stories from the past week that might affect civil engineering companies and professionals. Firstly, real-time flooding alerts for drivers. Old Dominion University researchers are using machine learning to make it happen. From Katherine Hafner at pilotonline.com. The researchers at Old Dominion University are working to develop a system that can, on its own, through artificial intelligence, detect spots that have flooded, and send alerts to drivers notifying them of problems on their route, armed with a new $1.5 million grant from the National Science Foundation. The first step is gathering data, lots of it. For machine learning to work, it needs a great deal of information on which to base its predictions. The researchers plan to use mostly surveillance video images from public agencies, as well as some sensors on the ground. The algorithm they plan to build will detect floodwaters in real time, as well as assessing how deep it is. The researchers will use LIDAR, short for Light Detection and Ranging, to help create a three-dimensional look at the road surfaces. Camera images can show the floodwaters' edges. The LIDAR-fueled 3D map will have the road's parameters. Combining the two can help determine how deep the water could be. After gathering enough data, Researchers turn to developing the predictive system itself. That means simulating realistic scenarios and tinkering with modeling. Interesting to think about how similar systems could be used to assist civil engineering professionals in their stormwater efforts, especially those representing or working with municipalities. Next up, let's look at an interesting story from Minnesota. Solar Array seeks to turn contaminated site into new energy from Post Bulletin staff reports at postbulletin.com. A partnership between Olmsted County and Minnesota, Synergy Power, and People's Energy Cooperative is turning tax forfeited land into an energy producer. Before Olmsted County acquired this land, it was originally a radar monitoring base used by the U.S. government. Matt Miller, the county's director of facilities and buildings operations, said, of the approximately six acres at 4613 70th Avenue Northeast in Haverville Township. A private purchase of the land, which was part of a larger property, led to the accumulation of waste and contamination that made much of the combined 22 acres unusable before the county invested time and money into the cleanup. Synergy is leasing the six acre portion to develop a solar array, which will sell the power to the People's Energy Cooperative through a 25 year agreement signed in May. The partnership between Synergy, the cooperative, and Olmsted County to restore the polluted site is expected to have a positive environmental and community impacts, according to the partners. The project will power approximately 200 homes in the region. It is great to see communities embracing alternative forms of energy. Next up, U.S. News and Civil Engineering. Engineers launch SE, Structural Engineering, 2050 Commitment to Reduce Embodied Carbon in Structures from Nadine M. Post at ENR.com. Last month at the virtual Green Build Conference, the Structural Engineering Institute of the American Society of Civil Engineers launched its EC, or Embodied Carbon Reduction Initiative, called the Structural Engineers 2050 Commitment Program. SE2050 is the first national program focused on structural engineering firm commitments to achieve net zero EC structural system designs by 2050. An office building structure 
can account for as much as 62% of the embodied carbon, 45% for the superstructure, and 17% for the substructure. For a hospital or school, the total EC is about 51%, with 40% in the superstructure. Structural Engineering Institute's formal statement regarding SE 2050 is, We, the Structural Engineering Institute of the American Society of Civil Engineers, support the vision and ambition of the SE 2050 challenge. We, as a leading structural engineering organization in the U.S., recognize the need for coordinated action across our profession to achieve the globally stated goal of net zero carbon by 2050. A tool available to help firms, whether or not SE 2050 members, is called the Embodied Carbon Order of Magnitude. Ecom is a simple estimator of industry average impacts of structural materials that allows the user to input basic quantities and a building area to output an order of magnitude EC impact. EMI has partnered with ASCE's SEI on several episodes of EMI's podcast, The Structural Engineering Channel, and EMI is open to helping SEI in whatever ways possible with embodied carbon and other powerful initiatives. Next up, let's head to the beautiful state of West Virginia. Fairmont State University engineering technology students draft the State Infrastructure Report Card from Emily McNamara at WBOY.com. Students in Fairmont State University's Department of Engineering Technology have collaborated with the American Society of Civil Engineers West Virginia section to draft the first ever infrastructure report card for the state. These reports are done in every state across the country about every four years. The purpose is to conduct the research necessary to rate West Virginia's infrastructure, and they do this across five categories. Those categories are roads, bridges, dams, drinking water, and wastewater. They learned the research. They got to meet with the government agencies, said Tabitha Lafer, an engineering technology professor at Fairmont State. Prior to COVID-19, we took field trips to the DEP and they got to meet the commissioner of the Division of Highways. They actually got to meet with them and then they got to work with the professional engineers in each category. These categories were evaluated based on the eight criteria, those being capacity, condition, funding, future need, operation, and maintenance, public safety, resilience, and innovation. Networking is a huge aspect of engineering. In general, this helps produce better engineers for the state of West Virginia. This is an amazing effort as it not only serves to continue to shine the light on the infrastructure needs of the U.S. and beyond, but it is giving civil engineering students the real chance to get real-world experience very early on in their careers, which is invaluable. Next up, some career inspiration for you. Let's take a quick break from the news for this week's civil engineering career inspiration. This week, I'm going to talk about something that may seem a little counterintuitive. To help become a better engineer, I think you need to find a passion outside of engineering. Bob Silman used to go to the opera. For me, I love coaching my kids in sports. For other people, it is traveling, being a foodie, teaching, getting involved in your community, whatever it is. It helps you become a more balanced individual and helps you see a different side of challenges rather than diving straight into the numbers. And now let's get back to the news. Next, let's move on to some international news and civil engineering from this past week. First up, we're headed to Danny Lou's London for an interesting story. Crossrail, Farringdon become first central London station to complete construction. From Rob Horgan at newcivilengineer.com. Construction work at Crossrail's Farringdon station will come to an end. The station becomes the first central London station along the new line to reach the T12 landmark. This means the station is substantially complete and it is now considered to be 12 weeks away from handover to the transport for London. Work at the station will now focus on the extensive testing and commissioning of the system ahead of the Elizabeth Line opening. Farringdon Elizabeth Line station has been built by the BAM, Ferrovio and Kier joint venture. The station will have two main entrances, with both with ticket halls, one at the Barbican and the other at the existing Farringdon Underground and Thames Link Station. Paddington is expected to be the next station where construction activity will complete and will then be followed by a number of the central London station sites over the coming months. 
It is interesting to think about how the schedule of these projects like these may have been impacted, possibly expedited, by the pandemic where not as many people have been using mass transit. Next up, an interesting story about airport safety measures. How technology is supercharging airport safety measures for 2020 and beyond. From Matt Alderton at redshift.autodesk.com. Before COVID-19, airports were bustling metropolises populated by an eager, expansive traveling public. Global airport traffic doubled from 2.25 billion passengers in 2006 to 4.5 billion passengers in 2019, but it is expected to be just 1.53 billion passengers in 2020, down 66% from the past year. Fewer passengers means lower revenue. The Airport Council International North America forecast that airports in the United States alone will use $23.3 billion in revenue. Additionally, 90% of the non-aeronautical revenue is passenger dependent. To recover from such devastating losses, airports say they need swift, significant government stimulus and relief. But that's not all that's required. The industry also needs to persuade anxious travelers that airports are safe and to continue investing in capital improvements that yield long-term gains despite short-term losses. Intelligent design and technology will be key for both. Despite the downturn in travel, airports everywhere have moved forward with construction projects they hope to keep them competitive when crowds return to the skies. For this, project managers using construction management software Autodesk BIM 360 to create COVID-19 checklists for airport projects in Denver, Dallas, and Seattle. In accordance with state guidelines, they performed health screenings every day on hundreds of field workers whose health status is electronically logged, tracked, and reported using iPads. Burl Happel Principal and U.S. West Coast Aviation Lead Patty Harburg Petrik envisions three zones for passengers in airports. A soiled zone that consists of everything outside the airport, including public transportation, taxis, and parking garages. A clean zone where baggage is sanitized and where travelers undergo health screenings, including rapid COVID-19 testing and a sterile zone, the terminal, that is healthy, clean, and safe. It is good to see that airport construction and capital improvement projects have continued, even in light of the reduced revenues. We'll keep an eye on these progressing projects should funding become available or not, as this may impact the workload of civil engineering firms in a big way. On that note, let's finish up with a few infrastructure-related stories. California Commission approves $2 billion in infrastructure projects from Eleanor Lamb at ttnews.com. The California Transportation Commission has approved $2 billion for 56 new projects, some of which aim to improve the movement of goods and reduce congestion. These projects are supported by three programs that were created by the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017. This legislation, also known as Senate Bill 1, raised the tax for diesel by 20 cents to 36 cents per gallon and for gasoline by 12 cents to 41.7 cents per gallon. The commission's scope of funding responsibilities covers highway, rail, transit, bicycle, and pedestrian infrastructure needs. Some of the projects recommended involve adding a truck climbing lane to a portion of Interstate 10 in Yubica, establishing express lanes on I-105 in Los Angeles, and a bridge widening project at the Calexico East Land Port of Entry. Approximately 60% of the approved funding represents projects located in Southern California, with the other 40 supporting projects in Northern California. The California Transportation Commission received 130 applications requesting a total of $3.7 billion, which is almost twice the amount of the funding that's available. From an economic perspective, these projects will move people and goods more efficiently while creating over 100,000 jobs. This is all good news for the citizens and civil engineers alike, and it does reinforce the importance of the advocacy for projects like these. How are you and your firm contributing to the advocacy efforts related to the infrastructure? Can you do more in 2021? Next up. Biden eyes infrastructure package to help economic and climate goals from Rebecca Beach at thehill.com. The Biden administration is eyeing a major infrastructure package as a way to boost the economy and advance its climate priorities. 
With lawmakers on both sides of the aisle, eager for progress after four years of fits and starts under President Trump. The coronavirus pandemic, however, has created an opening for large spending bills, and infrastructure proponents are hoping there will be momentum for legislation early next year to help the faltering economy. With such legislation aimed to fund typical road and bridge projects, Democrats are likely to push for bigger improvements in clean energy, transit, broadband, and more that were laid out in Biden's campaign proposals. House Democrats have already laid out their vision for how the infrastructure package could be used to boost environmental priorities. A $1.5 trillion package passed in July, but not taken up in the Senate, tied funding to states' carbon reduction efforts and provided billions for drinking water, transit, and clean energy. The measure also would create jobs between construction, ones normally associated with infrastructure by focusing on design, engineering, and small businesses as well. The Biden administration aims to boost public transportation as a key way to reduce emissions since the broader transportation sector is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. Biden has also called for universal internet access through either broadband or wireless 5G. Again, more news if that materializes would be good for both citizens and civil engineering professionals. We'll just have to see if it pans out. And remember, you may be able to make an impact in these activities through advocacy efforts. To wrap up, here's an inspiring quote to motivate you for the rest of your day. John Keller, the executive director at the New Jersey Turnpike Authority, speaking on episode 119 of the Civil Engineering Podcast said, Teamwork is teamwork. It doesn't matter if you're bouncing a basketball or if you're an executive at a company. You need to engage your people to want to be part of the team and to want to excel in their careers. This is a great piece of advice for both managers and employees. You are all on the same team. There you have it. That's what's happening this week in civil engineering. You can find references to all of the stories mentioned at twice.news. And all episodes are also published in video on EMI's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash engineering careers. Remember to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. And of course, YouTube for the video version. This is Jeff Smith signing off. We'll see you next week. Until then, be the best civil engineering professional you can be.